Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now Paul says in verse 12, now I'm not going to cover a long uh, distance in today's study, but I'm going to cover it real deeply. The next verse he says in verse 12, he says, Our proud confidence is this. This is what Paul's confidence was in. He says that the testimony of our conscience, that is, in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in this world, and especially towards you. Have you ever thought about how do we conduct ourselves in this world? Paul says that he conducted himself with a clear conscience. This almost got him stoned. Well, they actually did pick up rocks to stone him, you know, when he said, I have a perfectly clear conscience before God this day as he was testifying of the Lord and the work that God does. You know, when you ask the Lord to forgive you, how thorough is his cleansing? Though our sin be as scarlet, what did Isaiah say? He makes it white as what? The snow. It's clean. It's washed away. If you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need you to forgive me. He goes, done. And it says, as far as east is from west, in a straight line, he takes our sin and removes it from us. That's a long ways. That's infinity. You say, Lord, I got this dark mark on my soul. I, 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 this is a bad thing. Forgive me. Cleanse me. He goes, done. Give me that. And he's the best stain remover there is. I mean, spiritual stains that we get in our lives from sin. He just cleans it up and phew, gone. Now, I love this because it says in another psalm, he casts our sin into the sea. I got an ocean behind me just for visual aid. He calls it the sea of what? Forgetfulness. Never to be remembered again. So your sin gets... Whoosh, Sent out and down to the bottom, never to be brought up ever again. Uh, anyone into this, that the Lord forgives us that good? Now, it's not like my Nona and, 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 and my Sicilian side of my family that they, they say, we forgive you, but we're not going to forget. I don't know what it is. It's a maybe Italian thing. I heard a few Greeks are like that, too. Any confirmation? I have a few Greeks. Right? Yeah, same thing. They say, we forgive you, but we're not going to forget, right? This is, why, why is this? See, with the Lord, he says, I forgive you, and I cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. I'll never bring it up again. I like God's forgiveness way better than man's. It is so, it's, so, it's like a weight is lifted off my shoulder. It's just like, oh, thank you. Such a, such a kind God. He, he goes, I forgive you. And, you know, when I was a new Christian, I didn't quite understand that verse yet, so I, I'd be like, Guilt, guilty, you know, conscience about, not like Paul with a clear conscience. I had a guilty conscience about certain things I was doing wrong. And I'd be like, oh God, forgive me for doing this. And, and the Lord go, I forgive you. And I didn't understand because of my upbringing. I, I figured he still keeps it in the ledger book, even though he said he forgave me. So the next day, I, the guilts would come back. I'd be like, oh God, and about that thing I asked you to forgive me yesterday, please make sure you forgive me for that. And the Lord used this little black guy on this TV show. I'm trying to think of what it was called. Because it, it this little Coleman, Gary Coleman guy goes, What you talking about? What you talking about? And, 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 and what was it called? Yeah, the, the little guy, he used to go, What you talking about? And, and I was like, as soon as, I, as soon as I said the second day, Lord, forgive me. The, it was like the Lord just spoke that in my heart. What you talking about? Like, I already forgave you. I already cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. Why, why are you bringing it back up? It's gone. And that, was a, that might sound really simple to you, but that's a really deep spiritual truth. And when you ask the Lord's forgiveness, and he says, you're forgiven. I paid for that with my son's blood. The Lamb of God. What did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. Not takes your sin and keeps shoving it in your face. He takes our sin away. 
man, what a glorious feeling. He goes, and so I come back, Lord, but I still feel guilty about that. And he's like, what are you talking about? That's already been, we, we took care of that yesterday. It's gone. Move on. See, the one thing about the gospel is, the gospel is called, gospel means good news. This is good news. When you realize your sin is gone, cast into the sea of forgetfulness, you can now move on. You're free to move forward in life. And believe me, mistakes of the past. How many of you know someone that is stuck in a rut? I, I call it, you know, they're, they're stuck. They made a mistake in their past, and it just keeps haunting them. And they seem to never be able to get Every time you're around them, it comes back up. I say, Hi, it comes, it, it, it comes back. back. That's right. We're not supposed to look back. But they do. And the scripture says, do not look back. Don't call to mind the former things. Don't bring to mind the things of the past. It says to, to look forward. Press on, Paul says, to what higher and upward callings in the Lord. Don't be stuck in the past. But sin, when you don't deal with it, you're going to have a guilty conscience. And that guilty conscience is going to hold you back. Paul said here, our proud confidence is that the testimony of our conscience is that we have lived in holiness and in godly sincerity. We, we, we have done it as best we can. Holy means set apart, separated for God's use. We, we, we lived our lives separated for His use and with a godly sincerity. Sincere in, in Latin. Sin is without. Seri is, is, is wax. Sincere means without wax. Without wax. Okay, sin is without, sorry, in Latin it's without the, the thing and wax. It's a, it's a term that came from when they used to carve like marble statues. The guy would be chipping away on the, on the bust and the, you know, the, the, the chest and the head of the guy and he'd be on the nose and all of a sudden, you know, that marble soft tink and pink, the, the nose pops off. Well, the craftsman put all that work in. He's like, I'm not going to lose this baby. So it takes a little wax, a little bit of a little bit of the uh, of the stone uh, powder, mixes it together, gets the marble nose, smushes it back on there, and and finishes the project and keeps it in the shade. And then he sells it. And the problem with that is is that when it's um when it's when it's not the genuine article and they, that person buys it and takes it home and the sun hits it, what happens to the nose? melts and runs right off the face it falls off and and so the term sincere without wax meant the genuine article the whole thing is real it's not it's not been patched up with wax hiding the flaws this is how paul says we live with godly sincerity not with artificial fake you know i hate to tell you this but i can't even watch a lot of the christian television because I watch those fellows and they're like, praise Jesus, it's all wonderful today. There's nothing wrong in my life. And I'm like, you liar. <laughs> you know, that's not, I mean, what reality are you living in? Everybody, Jesus said, in this world you shall have what? Tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If the guy got up there and said, praise the Lord even though I have tribulations, the Lord says he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's my rock. I, he, he will get me through these things. I can handle a guy telling me that because I, I can say amen to that. I, I know what that feels like. But when the guy goes, there's nothing wrong, man. I know everything is just is a bed of roses without thorns since I came to Jesus. I'm like, what Jesus are you serving? Because they pounded thorns into my Jesus. And he didn't say we wouldn't have any thorns in our lives. He just said he would be with us and that he'd leave his spirit with us to comfort us. And Paul says, with godly sincerity, not fakeness. You know, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian and having a hard day. There's nothing wrong with even saying, hey, I'm having a hard time. Because when you're honest about it, maybe your, your friend or your co-worker might say, well, hey, I'll be praying for you. And they'll join in your sorrow and in your trial through prayers. And God will help them to grow in their prayer life. At the same time, 
he'll deliver you. And in that so doing, you'll see a, a little expression of God that you never would see if you just try to do it all on your own. When we try to do everything on our own, well, God's pretty good at showing us how, sh how much our strength is finite. If you don't think so, just, just talk to anyone who's had to face cancer, right? We, we, we find out how finite our strength is when we have to go through that real quick. He says, but we didn't, we didn't serve in our conscience with, with fleshly wisdom. He said, instead, we served with the grace of God. And we conducted ourselves in this world, especially toward you, with this grace. Man, it's so nice when Christians walk with grace. And our church is amazing grace. But I don't really want us just to have it as the name on the front. I want people who come here to go, those people are filled with grace. You know, they, they, there, there's... Now, what is grace? What, by definition, the Bible says grace is... A, a free gift, unmerited favor. It's a, it's a gift given that we didn't earn, God paid for. It actually wasn't free, as in cheap, inexpensive. It's very expensive. Our salvation cost God a lot. Cost him the very life of his only begotten son. It's, that's, a, that's a heavy price to pay, especially for a bunch of sinners. I mean, think about it. The Bible says, for a good man, one might dare die. But for an evil man... I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, let him perish. You know, he's evil. And God goes, no, let my son take his, that evil man's sin on him. He'll pay. He will be the lamb whose blood will be spilt, that perfect lamb, that offering to God, that will pay for even the evil man's sin. That blows my mind. What a loving God. I mean, he loves, he loves all the sinners. He didn't say, I love you when you get it together. By the way, if anyone ever says that to you, oh, I'm going to come to church once I get it together, tell them I'll never see you then. I mean, realistically, you're never going to see someone. Else. If you're going to wait until they get it together to come to church, I'm never going to see them. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. The church is, a, and, and we should make sure people know this, the church is a spiritual hospital. You don't have people wait till they get well to go to a hospital, do you? The, I need you to know this. This is a reality that is wrong in the minds of some people and the devil perpetuates this thing he tells people you're not good enough to go to that church well it'd be like saying to someone who's sick you're not well enough to go to the hospital duh i'm sick i need to go to the hospital if you're spiritually sick you need to get to church it's a spiritual hospital for your soul that's what it's there for and that we have other sick souls around us should not surprise us I mean, Mitch and I, we never get freaked out when we see the rest of you sinners. We just go, hey, welcome to the club. Okay, this is it. We know that, we know that this is not the museum of the righteous. This is the gathering where the sick come to the great physician. It's a spiritual hospital that we get to come to Jesus, who is the great physician of our soul. And he's there to help us. You know, and I, I feel like the candy striper or whatever in the hospital. I'm, all I do is point you to the doctor, get you to Jesus. He's the one who fixes people up. Some people think the pastors fix up people. We don't do that. We point you to the guy who got the power to fix you. Jesus is not us. We don't have the, any power I have is from him. And, and all the power he gives me is just to point you to him to get you where you need to go. That's who you need to see. You need your appointment with the great physician. My job is just to get people pointed to him. Now, if people understood that, I think people would feel a lot more comfortable going to churches because they'd be like, man, I need help right now. I'm not doing well. I'm struggling. I'm spiritually, like, hurting. I'm spiritually sick. Or I'm, you know, I, I, I'm spiritually, I, I, I've been blown up in this. I mean, there's some people, they're, they're like a mess. And so I hate it when I see churches going, you know, you need to clean up before you come in here. Did Jesus ever do that to anybody? They tell him, hey, you're not dressed right. Or you don't have a tie on. Or you don't have... I mean, I've, I've actually... I hate to tell you this. I've seen this in churches where people are like, you're not properly attired for this church. I didn't know Jesus cared about the outside. He, he seems like he always talks about the heart. Hey, what's on the inside? To the Pharisees, the ones that were actually dressed real nice, you know what he said about them? 
He said, you whitewashed tombs. You sepulchers. That's a compliment, right? A whitewashed sepulcher. A sepulcher is a, you know, a big, a big stone tomb. He goes, you guys are pretty and white on the outside and full of dead men's bones on the inside. Woohoo! Spirit and those were the spiritual leaders back then. You look, you look really good on the outside and you're dead inside. That's not what we want to be. We want to be full of the life of the Lord on the inside. The outside will take care of itself. I never worry about that. I found the Lord is really good at, at, at taking a person and helping them out with the outside, but he starts from the inside out. That's the focus. Now, Paul says this is a wisdom that he learned, not fleshly. Not flesh, fleshly wisdom always is concerned about stuff on the outside. But the Lord is concerned about stuff on the inside. And the fleshly wisdom, I like what James said. Would you turn to James chapter 3? James 3, everyone like knows John 3.16. I want to show you James 3.16. But I'll start at verse 15, just to put it in context. James chapter 3, verse 15. It's back a little bit from where we are towards the, towards the back of your Bible before 1st and 2nd Peter and, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John there, Jude. So if you're at, you're at the back, just back up a little bit till you find It's a small book, I know. It's only a couple, couple pages probably in your Bible. But find James chapter 3. I'll give you a second. And look at verse 15. He says this, um, he says the wisdom, this wisdom that is uh, that which comes down from above, he says this is, this is not that wisdom. Well, maybe I better back up to verse 13. He said, who's wise amongst you? Any of you have understanding you're wise? He said, let him show by his good behavior and by his deeds in gentleness of wisdom. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy... Or if you have selfish ambition, if it's all about you, me, 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 I need some me time. I, I, you ever heard that, you know, need me time? It's all about me. He says that, am, that selfish ambition, he says, is in your heart. He says don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's what comes from the earth. It's earthy, natural. It's demonic. He says, for wherever jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder and every evil thing. He says, but the wisdom from above, ah, the wisdom from above is first pure, and it's peaceable and gentle and reasonable, and it's full of mercy, full of good fruit. It's unwavering without hypocrisy. The seeds whose fruit is sown in righteousness are sown in peace by those, it says, who make peace. What a sweet thing when we, when we walk in the, in the things from above, the, the pure, the, the, the peaceable, the gentle things, the merciful things of God. But whenever a person is, is focused on things about, well, I'm, I, want, I want that, and they're jealous. Someone else has it. That wisdom's not from God. That wisdom's from down below. The devil uses jealousy and selfish ambition all the time to sidetrack a lot of Christians. He gets them focused, and I, I hate it because even within the context of some of the teachings that people are saying they got from the Bible, which they're not, they're not balanced teachings, they're really out of balance. They're saying, God, God made you a child of the king. As one of his children, you deserve to have a mansion and a Mercedes. And I do too, so give me more of your money so I can get my fifth Mercedes and my fifth mansion and I mean, there's some preachers out there that, that are preaching stuff that is not the gospel. It's a false teaching. And it's not, that's not from the Lord. That stuff is all about selfish ambition. And every time that you get selfish ambition or jealousy, you ever walk into, listen to this, he says, there will be disorder and every evil thing. Have any of you ever walked into a place and just felt like there was like chaos in the room? I mean, there's just a, a tension in the air. You, you're like, something's up, man. It could be a workplace. It could be a family gathering. Not, not, that wouldn't happen, right? And there's this tension. I mean, so thick you could cut it with a knife, and you're just like, 
What's going on? I submit to you, someone in the room has a, a jealousy. Or somebody has a selfish ambition in the room. Somebody wants it done their way. They want the plates to be set out this way. They want the food in that row. They want this that way. And it has caused tension in the whole family, all because one person wants it their way. Anyone can give amen that you've experienced this? Does this really happen? Yeah. Because this is wisdom from below. The wisdom from below it wants everything its way. It's not from above. Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle, reasonable. You know, some of those people are not reasonable who want their thing their way. You say, but what about if we just did it this way? I don't want it that way. It's got to be this way. All right, we found the contention. We found the source of the, of the tension. And you know what? Sometimes you have to tell people, and this is a hard word. Some Christians are so set on getting it their way, they don't realize they're the source of, of the tension because it's coming not from above. Their wisdom they're operating on is from below. It's earthy. It's demonic. You know, Peter, this reminds me of Mark's gospel in chapter 8 when Jesus said to Peter, um, you know, who do men, they, he, he took him to Caesarea Philippi in, in Mark 8. He said, who do men say that I am? And, you know, some, some say you're Elijah, some back from the dead. Some say you're one of the prophets and uh, maybe Moses back, you know, we don't know. And, 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 and Jesus said, well, to Peter, who do you say I am? Do you remember this? You can look there if you want Mark chapter 8. Let's see in verse uh, 29. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Mashiach in Hebrew. You're the one sent to save. And he warned him. He said, don't tell anyone about this. Now in, in, in Matthew's gospel, he says, good job, Peter. That revelation is not from man. Where, where was the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah from? From God. I can just see Peter's head just swelling. Did you hear that, guys? <laughs> me and God, we're tight. I'm tied in, man. I got that from God. I'm like down the pipe right to me. I got, you guys didn't get it. I got it. That's Jesus. He's the Messiah. The only problem is if you read a couple verses later, right? Jesus said, now I'm going to go die for you guys. And I'm going to be crucified and beaten and buried. And three days later, I'm going to rise. And what was Peter's answer? No, by no means, Lord. You can't die. Where are we going to get free lunch? No, he didn't say that out loud. I just interjected that. Because he'd been following Jesus for three years and he didn't have to worry about his meals. And all of a sudden he's going, no. And what was Jesus' answer to him? I love this because Mark tells us. Now Mark... For those of you who don't know, Mark wasn't one of the apostles with, John Mark wasn't with Jesus. John Mark was the young man that he got to hang out with Peter. So I wonder where he learned this. Because he writes, and um, Jesus, after he, Peter took him in, aside and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, no, Lord. Verse 33 says, Jesus turned around seeing his disciples and he rebuked Peter. And he said to Peter, what? Get thee behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Now Peter, who just had a revelation from heaven that Jesus was the Messiah, shows me how fickle men are. I feel like I'm glad Peter was in the book here because you ever had one day where you're having a really good spiritual moment and and you're followed by some jerk who cuts you off in traffic and you think I want to park my car on your chest <laughs> you idiot and you're like Ugh! and from one moment you're so spiritual to the next minute you were praising God with a radio cranked and praise songs playing and next thing you know you're thinking Death threats. What happened? Just a little shift of interest. You went from the interest on the things of God to the interest on the things of man. Peter did it. And Jesus called him on it. He said, get behind me, Satan. This is literally what happened. And see, if I tell Christians, 
when they're sitting there being so dogmatic. It has to have the, the you know, y y you go to have a, what we call an agape feast, a love feast, where you share a, some church call it potluck. I don't like that term. It's kind of scary. You know, potluck. Anyway, but but you, 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 you come and you bring food to share with one another and you set it out and then there's those aunties are like it all has to go this way and that way and this way and everyone's all tensed out and you know the whole idea is to come together for joy to share the love and the and see i grew up a time when you share food that's like sharing love when you introduce tension with the love i found it really interesting i was watching the the news and they said new study finds that giving of thanks before partaking of food has great physical benefits. Duh. Like, I mean, like, this is like a, I mean, this is on, this is on CNN, okay? They're like, this is, poof, mind blown. We found out if you give thanks before you eat your food, it does something, additional benefits happen to your body. Your blood pressure reduces, your digestion improves, and they give all these, you know, physiological things that happen for giving of thanks. I'm like, yeah. But what about you have the person that stresses everyone out before the meal? Don't eat that olive! <laughs> Back! We haven't said grace yet. And they got all the food lined up and, you know, God love you if you're one of those people who think you can't have one nibble before. Like somehow it's going to ruin the meal or ruin the digestion or ruin the whole atmosphere because you have olive in your teeth. I don't know what they're thinking. It's just an olive. Let them eat it. See, this is where they need to go to my Nona's house. She put out food to nibble on while the other food was cooking so that you're like, just the juices are starting to go and then they, and then it's a crescendo when it's time to eat the pasta and the bread and all the gnocchi and all the, you know, I mean, all the, f I can't keep talking like this. My mouth is starting to water. It's before lunch now. We got to finish now because I got to go eat. I just thought of all these wonderful things. See, if you got one, just one person not walking in godly wisdom, just one is all it takes. It's amazing how much tension can be introduced to a group of people where one person starts fleshing out. That's what I call it. They're, they're, they're in the flesh, in that fleshly wisdom. They want everything done their certain way. And it's all about, it's not about the others there. It's about them. What they say and how they want it to go and how they want it prepared and how they want it served and how they want everyone else to comply to their wishes. Guys, I have news for you. Paul says we didn't conduct ourselves this way. We conducted ourselves in sincerity, without wax, just genuine people. Do you think Paul would have snitched an olive at the table? If he was hungry, I bet he'd go... That looks good. Can I have an olive? You know? Yeah. Or Timothy. He's a young man. Young men are always hungry. It's just part of life. We have to be, are we willing to live with godly sincerity in holiness, you know, with a good conscience before people? So people see us and they see, man, the guy's not perfect, but he really tries to maintain a good conscience. He always, if he does something wrong, I, I admire my son, Daniel. He is quick to repent. I wish I was as tender-hearted towards the Lord as he is. I, I see him, he'll do something wrong, and he, I've seen him go and ask forgiveness to somebody. Hey, I'm sorry I did that. Like 10 minutes after he did it, I'm like, I'll wait two days. Man, I ain't going to say I'm sorry right away. You know, God's going to like work me over a little. I should be like that, though. You sleep better when you, when you are quick to repent. Guys, we, we should just live genuine, holy before the Lord, like real people, and say, hey, it's just, this is it. And let God's Spirit work through us so that the things from above are what is present in our lives and in our midst. Because that's what people tell. That, that, that's when they come around you and they go, you know, I, w I went to that church and the people were real. I love to, when the, you are going to laugh, but when people, I always get feedback. It's a, you know, pastor title on the door. They just think that means feedback department or complaint department. But either way, they're going to tell me everything they didn't like or they did like. I'm going to find out somehow. 
one of the sweetest things is when I, I get the little thing off the bottom of your bulletin, the little thing that says prayer requests and Bible questions, and someone writes, please pray for our fellowship to have love, genuine love like this church. Now, you don't know how much my heart just leaps. I'm like, I mean, it's sad for the, for, I, I do pray for the fellowship wherever they're attending, but that they can come here to a little church on a beach in Hawaii and feel the love of God present in this group. You look around, how many of us do you think would hang out with each other if it wasn't for the Lord? I mean, maybe a couple of us, we might run into each other at a soccer game or something. I don't know. I mean, but really, the, we have a, like a love in this midst of this group that is from above. And when people come and they see that, they're drawn to the Lord because of that. That's a sweet thing. As a pastor, you just go, yeah, all right. But the only way we can continue that, that, that streak is we have to be like Paul, genuine, no wax, no fakey, just be who you are. You having a rough day? Okay. Maybe the brother next to you is going to be the one that's going to be praying for you this week and joining you in prayer. Or maybe you're going to be the one that's going to help someone else because maybe they're struggling and you are going, how can I help them? Well, you got the answer today. You can join them in prayer through their trial. Just say, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. And like our brother said, in a foxhole, it doesn't matter. I don't care if they say they're an atheist. When they're going through it, you can tell them, I'm praying for you. And you know what? It's amazing that I, I really testify. The atheists have told me, thank you. I don't believe in God, but thank you. Pray anyway. You seem to. And it, it's weird. They're like thankful that someone is praying for them. Now, you think that one through. How much of an atheist can they really be? Inwardly, our conscience knows there's a God. You can argue it all you want, but God put it in you. And he put that, that knowledge of him deep within each man. Sometimes it just needs a little watering. It's like a seed, you know. It's buried in the garden, but you need a little water, a little sunshine, and then the thing sprouts. And that's all I, I get the privilege of doing. It's just watering seeds, planting seeds, and letting God cause the growth in people's life. It's a sweet job. Sweet job. Do I get a lot of rest? No. Who cares? I'll rest when I'm dead. I joke about that. I'll rest when I'm in heaven. I won't really be dead. I'll be upstairs, present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I look forward to that. I shared that with Dottie this last week just to remind her. I told her, your husband's already ahead of Bill. He's already there. This week was her, let me think, 50. What was it? She'll be 88. Her birthday but her husband and her married uh, 60, would, if he was alive still, was going to be 68 years or something. They were, she was married to her youth. So she sa I said, well, when you get up there with Bill, her husband, you, you guys, so he suffered greatly in his last days. And she had to watch him suffer. And I told her, you know, he's in a new body now. He's not suffering. New body made by God. I said, you guys are going to be going waltzing. She goes, you, you think we're really going to get to dance? I said, oh, I already know. It says in Revelation, the dance before the Lord. I said, and Dottie's a dancer. Those of you who didn't know, she used to do ballroom dancing and stuff. And she's like, I said, yeah, you'll be up there cutting the rug with, with your hubby and just uh, rejoicing before the Lord. And you say hi to my dad for me and my grandfather and my brother Joe. And the meeting place is at the tree. Don't forget the tree with the 12 different fruits. Just follow the throne of God, the river of life. There's going to be a tree right there. And, and it's, it's got 12 different fruits, one in each season. That's the tree of life. Go to that tree. When, when, when it's my turn, I get to heaven. I don't have to know the whole layout. I only know the landmarks. Throne of God, river of life, tree, 12 different fruits, one in each season. I told my grandfather this. I'll meet you at the tree. I mean, it's the meeting spot. At least for us, that, you know, we, we made it. That's where we'll meet up. I said, you just go there. you meet my dad. You'll see Don, my assistant pastor. He'll be there. Remember Don? He'll, he'll take you around. He'll show you all the good place to eat. D Don loved food. I'm sure he's, gonna, he's had a head start on me. He's been there for a while. He'll be like, come on, Is I've got to show you where the golden Kamado is. You know, we'll be, we'll be going somewhere to eat, and he'll have it all figured out. I can't wait. You know, the kids always ask me, will we eat in heaven? That's a good question. How do you have a marriage supper of the lamb without supper? 
No. You eat. You get to eat. I'm sorry. You know, it says we are created in whose image? God's image. You look at how we're made, just think, we're just in his image. Now, I can't wait, guys. I mean, there's going to be some. For those of us, like, I have trouble with dairy down here. I'm be I'm, I'm having me a big ice cream sundae up there. I'm pretty sure I won't be lactose intolerant up there. They have like perfect cows for the milk or whatever. I mean, I'm sure that the Lord knows in my glorified body how to whip up some really tasty, you know, frozen desserts. That, uh, uh, I, you guys think I'm joking. You wait. We're going to have so much fun. And if people just read the scripture for what it says, they would be so excited about what lies ahead. They would be like, Man, we have so much. What's the streets made out of in heaven? You guys know this, right? Pure gold. So pure light can pass. We can't make gold that pure. We know it's theoretically possible. But you have to get it to not 99.9%. .9 it has to be 100% pure for metal to have light pass through it. And God goes, oh, yeah, that's what I use for asphalt. We, we think it's so ex so valuable. We make our, ju our wedding ring out of it, you know, our uh, uh, jewelry and... And, and Kyle goes, yeah, you're using asphalt for your decorations. That's really interesting, you know. You don't even have the good stuff. It's like cloudy and can't see through it. He's got the pure stuff for the streets. And the gates adorned with gold and, and jewels and pearls. I mean, guys, we have so much to look forward to. We should just be like, I can't wait. I told Dottie just a little recap of those things, and she was getting more and more excited. I can't wait. I can't wait. Do you think... Do you think, I said, look, Dot, if some really handsome gentlemen show up, say, we're here to take you to be with Jesus, you know, Lord sends a couple angels to you to get you, just go. Just go. You're done. Her body is failing. Her spirit is strong. Her mind is struggling. And she's like, do you think that would be okay? I said, it's fine. The Lord, if the Lord sends some angels, that's just your cue. You're done. She goes, well, what do I do till then? I said, what do you think? She goes, well, I think I should borrow the walker from the lady next to me. She's not using it. And I'll go up and down the halls and see if I need to talk or pray with somebody. Doesn't that sound like Dot? Go do it, Dot. I said, make sure you drink your water. She's forgetting to drink, you know. Get older, you forget to drink, and then you get foggy brain. We all do. Dehydration. Get foggy brain. So anyone talks to her, tell her, did you drink your water? Pastor Izzy said. Gets rid of the foggy brain. Helps you think clearly. She's so sweet. Let's pray. Father, I pray for Dot right now. I pray for anyone else who's facing trials in their body where the body is failing. Lord, I'm thankful that we have the promise of a new body made by you. Eternal in the heavens. And we so look forward to the day when this, this mortal body will be swallowed up by immortal. And the, this corruption will be swallowed up by incorruption. Thanks for that sweet promise of hope that you've given us. And while we tarry, Lord, just give us grace to live in these days. Help us to live like Paul did with a, with a godly sincerity and a, and a good conscience before you, Lord. Always being quick to repent of our sin. And Lord, basking in that truth that you, you remove our sin. For as east is from west from us, Lord, make us clean this day. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that have sinned against us. Let us to go forward into this week, Lord, that we could be filled and led of your spirit with, with, with his guidance, Lord. What you have for us, guide us by your Holy Ghost, we pray, into this next week. We ask these things in Jesus, your son's precious name. In his name we pray. And all that agree with me said... Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.